And I'm going to turn this directly over to Dr. Spacuza, who's going to discuss life. Life. <laughs> As a superintendent. A day in the life of Dr. Spacuza. There you go. You Here don't you want go. a day in the life. <laughs> but I will share with you uh, two quick announcements. Um, we do have our um, homecoming game at 7 o'clock this Friday. Don't believe any of the forecasts. <laughs> that is just hyperbole. Um, I guarantee it'll be a wonderful and heated jackets I, um, might be the way to go. Also, um, Saturday night is our Hall of Fame. So every other year we are inducting members of the community from past alumni from Prescott. And we have two inductees. That is, uh, tickets can be purchased over at the high school. They can be purchased at the day of the event. But we would prefer, obviously, when you're trying to have um, and host people with dinner, it would be nice if you could buy tickets ahead of time. Um, Ellie, do you remember the first time we met? Oh, um, bus. What grade were you in? Elementary school. Elementary school. So one of the joys I have is a life in the superintendent. What is it all about? Well, I'll talk about that. That's what Franz had shared and asked me to talk to you about. And the difficulty is it's not what you think it is. Um, and But at the center of it is Lucas and Ellie because it's all about students and it's all about building communities. And um, I had the pleasure of um, riding the bus routes my first year when I came into Prescott. And she was reading a big book at the time, and it was a long route, and that's how I met her and watched her, and I can't believe that you're already in high school. So in a blink of an eye, um, our children are growing up around us. Um, quick just poll. How many of you have some affiliation with Prescott Public Schools in that you either have a child that's enrolled, you have a spouse that works there, or somebody or you had previously worked with the Prescott Public Schools. Raise your hand. So look around. A preponderance and a majority of you, and I still see many of your faces that come out and support um, public school, but also the community. And I think that what I wanted to share with you uh, today is um, kind of, I talked to Franz and he, he said, well, everybody wants to kind of know a day in the life, but they also kind of want to see what is um, the job and role and function of a superintendent. And I think it's probably one of the most challenging to put into words. <laughs> Because at the center are our students that we celebrate, and it's about student learning and high achievement. Um, my history is that um, my mom and dad uh, are um, first generation to college. My surname, Spacuza, is Italian. My grandfather worked um, out of the South Water Market. He delivered produce, and he worked with his father, and at the August welcome back to our faculty, I shared the wagon and the horse that drove, uh, pulled that wagon as he used to deliver to all the corner grocery stores. He never went beyond fifth grade. Uh, my other grandfather, uh, my mother's side, is all Irish and very traditional Irish. He delivered milk, ice, and then became a firefighter for the Chicago uh, um, Fire Department. And he, memorialized in a book as they used to put on shows uh, in Chicago where they would climb ladders and things like that and as a community you come out and kind of watch that. Again, neither um, of my mother's parents went to college. Um, she graduated high school in three years, went to college and graduated. She was married by the time she was 19. Uh, my, married my father and he was stationed as a lieutenant in the Navy in Hawaii during peacetime. But they would fly he uh, did the navigation for the flights, and they would fly over and looking for um, kind of just um, different infiltration, if you will, in our seas. And then my mother uh, was an educator, and she um, did stay home as we were kind of growing up and things like that, and then ended up being a high school uh, math teacher and taught kind of high-end math. I graduated um, not really sure what I was going to do. I went to Creighton University out in Nebraska. It's a Jesuit uh, university and was kind of caught between um, my father's role where he initially worked for the IRS 
uh, worked in a, a steel can factory to make additional money and then went to law school at night. He ultimately worked for a bank outside of Chicago and he opened one of the largest trust offices in um, the suburban area of the Chicago land area. Um, so there was a lot of push to go into finance and a lot of push to kind of pursue that in business. Um, then my mother was in education and then I was a psychology major. So put all that together and try to figure out what happens. I ended up going out to New York City and taught there in a middle school on the lower east side of Manhattan, uh, just below Houston, um, between 1st and 2nd Avenue. It was at the time, I've since taken my family back there, the school now since has closed, and it has reopened um, in the Bronx. Their mission uh, is to work with students from the public schools and to identify a way for them to get scholarships, make sure that they can go to high school and then college. They uh, provide year-long uh, schooling. Uh, it was a uh, nativity mission center and it was uh, run by the Jesuit priests. They uh, provided that opportunity to students and then they would go up to Lake Placid every year and the students would learn how to swim, the students would learn how to kind of uh, camp and things like that and as uh, faculty we were expected to work 12 months a year. I did that for two years and there was a specific student um, that was struggling. He was 13 years old, he was in eighth grade and could not read. And I was just shocked. We were trying to figure out as we met as a faculty is how could a 13 year old student literally be in middle school and it wasn't because of a second language but it was because he couldn't read. And we uh, decided that we had to go out and seek some additional, uh, if you will, assessment to try to find out what could we do as educators to help a child that was struggling at this age. And we ended up getting, I talked to the principal, we got him back, uh, reports back, and it was like a yellow pages of a report. But there was nothing functional that we could use as teachers. And I was really, really, really just distraught. But here we were, we put a child through and a family through a bunch of assessment and we didn't get back anything that was useful. But I learned of a whole new field and it was school psychology. And it was an opportunity to see that school psychologists play a role in an educational uh, perspective and I never had seen or heard of a school psychologist. But I was a psychology major, I was working in education. You put those two together and I went up to Fordham and started a couple of classes. And um, ended up enrolling at the University of Minnesota and got my doctorate there in educational psychology. Um, I tell you that as a little bit of a background because I got into public education through assessment and kind of the individual student and as No Child Left Behind came into vogue, I was working in the Minneapolis public schools. We were very intrigued of building, if you will, what is now called big data. Um, in Minneapolis, when I was there, we were working off a big uh, Unix uh, mainframe computer. You, when you printed, you would go down to a basement and get your print jobs. When I was at graduate school, we used to print. You might not believe this today, but we would print. We'd have to go to another building just to pick up our graduate papers. Um, you didn't print in your own office. And yet, the University of Minnesota was part of the internet and that kind of came up. I still remember writing my first email, bringing my wife in to see it on the black screen. And she goes, what's the big deal? And I'm like, do you see? I just communicated with somebody. But that's for another day. But as we were kind of working on in Minneapolis, if you think of the demographics, it had 50,000 students at the time that I was there. It was bigger than the University of Minnesota. We were looking at kind of the differential performance of students with special education, students that had free and reduced lunch, students that didn't have a home language of English, and trying to look at whether or not our programs were effective. And so it wasn't just about status, but it was about growth. And we started to work with the University of Chicago, um, their policy department, and a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also the uh, state of Tennessee, and they called it value-added research. And we were looking at if you could take data on students that was progressive across time and control for certain variables if you could identify programs that worked. And so I worked in Minneapolis with uh, 10 other PhD individuals and psychometricians and it was like being a kid in a candy store. It was my first part of education. But for me, there was still a disconnect from working with students. 
And so as I continued to progress, I did end up uh, working then with the Moundsview Public Schools and did assessment. I went to South Washington County, which is just up 61, and ended up uh, taking on and building their assessment and research program. And then two years into the stint, their teaching and learning department individual uh, quit. And the superintendent came to me and asked me if I would take that on. Um, 15,000 students, 18 buildings at the time, and I continued to do, oversee both the teaching and learning department and also the assessment department. What I learned from that, though, was getting into the realm of understanding scientific research and the impact, but also a broader perspective of administration, because I now started to have multiple direct reports. I was one individual trying to be productive and doing um, analytics, but then I couldn't do it. So I started to have to hire somebody to build a data warehouse. I had to hire different individuals to oversee curriculum, curriculum development. Um, went back to Moundsview and uh, moved into a deputy superintendent position and started to look for superintendent positions. Uh, was very blessed to see this come up. My uh, daughter had been taking some dance lessons. She was in the theater department. She was at Stella um, and doing some dance lessons. And we learned a little bit about Prescott at the time, but didn't uh, have anything specific. And all of a sudden, that job came open. And so um, five years ago, uh, applied and was uh, selected to become the superintendent here. So what is a superintendent? And I got into it about high achievement and student learning. But the challenge is, as you get into it, is that on a business perspective, you saw how many people in this room are somewhat affiliated. How many individuals have been either a superintendent or a school board member? And Franz, who invited me, was a school board member. And as a school board member or superintendent, you know the types of things that maybe sometimes the public doesn't always learn, but the types of decisions that have to be made. Our budget for the Prescott Public Schools currently is just under $25 million on an annual basis. We have over 246 employees, and then we have different subsidiaries underneath our kind of umbrella. And so, for example, I put out our um, newsletter at each of the tables just kind of described, but the one prior to that describes kind of the different organizations or departments. And so we have a transportation department. We have both the mechanic and all the drivers. We have over 22 buses that cost about $100,000 each. And we are on a cycle where we replace a bus every 20 years. And so we are currently always uh, working on trying to make sure that we keep our equipment up to date, making sure that it meets all the regulations. We hire our transportation drivers. They have a unique uh, driver's uh, um, license that occurs. But we also provide transportation for independent programming. So for the parochial school, we are picking up and delivering the students to St. Joe's. We also are picking up and dropping off the students for four k centers that we partner with um, Hearts, Hands, and Minds, St. Joe's, and also um, New Adventures. We also have a food service department. Tina Stenroos oversees the food service department. Again, that is completely has to make or break on its own budget. There is no additional money coming in. Um, she hires all of her cooks. We have the equipment that is run. One of the things in public education and what I started to see is that my job ultimately, and in the, even in the school board policy, it defines the job of the superintendent as the CEO. And I know that sometimes when that gets brought up, some people go, boy, the superintendent thinks he's the CEO, he can make every decision. And I'll share with you that that's highly not the case. Um, but there is one employee of the school board, and that's the superintendent. And so there's this relationship between a board that's different than a city council. A school board, their power and only power is when they are together, five members, in a quorum once a month. And then once they go out, they are citizens. And so all of the administration management fiscal is provided by the superintendent, their employee. that gets evaluated and determined whether or not they continue. They provide that oversight. Food service also leads into, we have uh, multiple buildings within our district. Starts with a 1924 high school uh, that became our middle school and has been remodeled a few times, most lately uh, 2004. 
We have um, our Malone Elementary that was built in 1963. We have our intermediate school that was built in 1969 and opened in 1970, and then later added a lower floor for uh, programming. And that's to make sure I don't talk too long. And um, then we have the new high school that opened in 2016. So as we look at the different buildings and the shifts, a lot of it has to do with making sure that we are meeting the needs of a community that has changed from when my grandfather was delivering produce just a couple generations ago in a horse and carriage to now where you have multiple UNFI trucks and things like that distributing or Amazon and drones. Um, and so there are amazing things that are transpiring and as an educational system, our job is to create learning environments. Not just a learning environment for students, but I really believe my job is a lead learner. And that is that I continue to try to stay sharp in many facets of the organization and also have to model that for our staff and then also provide the opportunity for our teachers to continue to <coughs> learn. We have to provide opportunities for all of our supervisors to learn. Um, beyond our custodial and maintenance, we also have a uh, lead nurse. And if you think about public education today, um, we have somebody that's worked in public health. Right? And so as we think about the types of ailments that students have, whether or not it's asthma or diabetes, we have students that have epilepsy. We have students that are taking different types of prescription medication for anxiety or other aspects. You can't just allow them to carry that around. That has to be mitigated and overseen. And so there's rules and regulations for that. We also do, obviously, data processing. We have an HR department that has to hire, has to discipline, has to recruit. Um, Act 10, uh, many of you in Wisconsin know about the kind of uh, taking away the collective bargaining for different units. Some people like it and some people don't. What I can tell you is a very unique situation. When I talk from my experience over in Minnesota, where you have collective bargaining, now you have an issue where you don't get to collective bargain, but you probably don't just roll off and say, this is what you're going to make, you're done. And also now you have 246 independent contractors. If everybody says, I want to raise, I don't have the bandwidth personnel trying to organize everybody around resources and ultimately our students to be able to individually negotiate with 246 people. So there's a blessing and a curse from all of these decisions. It's not right or wrong. It just puts a different task demand on a superintendent. Um, we also have specific programming that we're required to do. And so not only do we provide, I always talk about that we are the Statue of Liberty. And that is that public education is open to every single individual. And so regardless of age, we provide programming before third grade and we partner with the Pierce County. We do have three-year-old uh, up through five-year-old programming for special education. We currently provide 4K services, some of it in-house and some of it partnered with our community. One of the things just to let you know is that current uh, <coughs> the legislature is presently kicking around and the Senate uh, yesterday did pass for the first time to look at changing the age of 4K of when they, so you don't have to be September, it'd be that you could be four years old at any time and still participate and looking to provide funding for all day 4K. Now, just because they would doesn't mean we go there, but that now changes the landscape because at, in partnering with our 4K centers, they don't have the facilities to run the number of sections that we would have if it went all day. So the environment that we work in is that we create a large organization of $25 million that has um, absolutely no cash intake based on the products we create. It's all based on the investment of a community. And that is really hard for people sometimes to go because we want schools to be everything for all the kids that come through. And yet the only way that you can do that effectively is that you have to organize resources. And so I, I'm going to kind of end with what I usually work with our school board and our parent groups and our teachers is that at the center of everything we do, and we can never forget this day in and day out, is that we are a learning organization, both for personally, but also for our students around high achievement. 
And I'm going to use learning or education in the broadest sense. It's not just an academic test score, which you're seeing a lot in the press right now, which we're doing quite well, and you'll hear more about that next Wednesday. But it's also about um, being good citizens. It's about giving back to community. It's about social skills. It's about social emotional health, nutrition, and mental health. So when we talk about student learning, it is the broadest sense of the word, not just uh, very specific. But none of the programs that we have, or the advancement of programs, so if you think about digital age and computers and things like that, for our students to be able to learn how to code, or for our students to be able to use technology, we have to have the infrastructure to do that, and yet I can't make more widgets or change the cost of those widgets in order to bring in revenue to build infrastructure. It's all based on the community and whether or not they're willing to invest. The state does provide, and so do you as taxpayers out of your um, property tax. And I hear it, I get a lot of it. Uh, questions about property tax, I can tell you that your mill rate, the proportion of anybody that lives in the Prescott School District, has decreased over the last three years. The proportion of people, what you are paying has continuously gone down while the financial oversight from the school board, we've been setting aside money, we have over $400,000 for capital that we can open in a trust fund starting August 2022. Our fund balance is the highest it's ever been, purposely for two reasons. We, for over three, almost three decades, have had to take short-term loans just to pay our employees between November and January, every year. That's additional money that we're paying for interest. And so, last the, two years ago, we were able to take the smallest amount, and last year we didn't, and I believe that um, we'll be um, the second consecutive year where we don't have to take a short-term loan just to pay for our staff. More importantly, what is the job of a superintendent? I think it's to be able to identify how do we organize and mobilize resources to meet the primary reason we exist, and that's to create a learning environment for our students. So it's coming in and working with to facilitate with the community and multiple stakeholders. So it's not my vision, it's not my mission, but it's defining why we exist. And every, over the last five years, every single school and most of our departments have taken on and embraced this discussion about why do we exist in um, partnership with the school district in order to support student learning. And I've been very proud, if you've looked at our website or if you look at the newsletters that are going out, you'll see that all of the mission statements and vision statements have been updated, and we continue to do that throughout the whole organization. Our school board will be kind of um, endorsing their um, strategic direction, mission, and vision over the next three months. So it's my job to marshal that and to create a North Star so that we're all rowing in the same direction. We might get there in different directions, but as we do that, and you start to define your boundaries, you know that I, superintendents, then have to create thick skin. Because by defining why you exist and what you're attempting to do, you have a community that may or may not buy in. You have staff that may or may not want to buy in. For staff, we say this is why we exist and this is how we'll behave. And if this isn't the place for you, there are many other jobs. For the community, we have to make sure that we align with the community in what we're trying to accomplish and the students that we're trying to um, graduate over time. We are and continue to adapt. Uh, no one is perfect, no organization is perfect. And so we do work just like any other organization or business is trying to look at efficiencies. And the reason that I think our uh, financial status is um, much improved is that there's been a continuous improvement model in every department, from our transportation, about our routes, we reduced a route, we reduced a bus, um, we're looking at different types of fuels, um, we look at when we buy fuel, and we buy it on the markets, we store some so we kind of hedge our bets. Um, our teachers have done a remarkable job. Um, last night we had a work session with our school board for two hours. We went over all of the different types of tests, the test scores, we had them walk through just one analysis, one grade, and they were like just exhausted and we were sharing how in-depth our teachers 
are working on this. But the continuous improvement is in alignment with the mission and to improve student achievement. The school board is invested in over 10 uh, professional development days throughout the calendar year. It's when students aren't present, not just snow days, but when you guys have your off days, September 30th and October 25th, our teachers are still there coming together to learn and hone their craft. And we continue to do that, and it's an incredible piece. If you think about wanting to be innovative and creative mm -hmm. as a professional, where do you get that? Typically, it's in that social engagement with your colleagues to learn and kind of um, experience what it's like, or even to sometimes just have a confessional of talking a little bit about the difficulty of the job and task at hand. In fact, I brought forward is that the everlasting burden on public education. And so if you look at kind of the 1900s and 1910s, it's the basic lessons were on nutrition, immunizations, and screenings. Then we got into child labor laws that swept the nation, began to track students from 1910 to 1940. Now I'll just rattle off some of the things that teachers are faced with right now, is that you have kind of no child left behind, or state or national accountability, internet safety, bullying, Alice training, or because of gun violence. Um, we talk about bus safety, social media, suicide awareness, organ donor, steroid abuse, media literacy, expanding early childhood wraparound programs, financial literacy, intruder lockdowns, health and wellness programs, leadership training, contextual learning, entrepreneurial innovation skill development, credit retrieval, online learning, common core, um, STEM. The types of things and what I share with our staff is that our jobs typically are trying to address many of the social ills. And so when there's programs that come in place for alcohol and drug, you get there. If you have things about children can't learn, we'll have a new program about literacy. So there's things about the internet that our students are experiencing, and so we have to teach about what are appropriate and inappropriate things. We have to do that with boundaries and with our staff. So public education is taxed as an organization to do many things that we sometimes forget, but ultimately um, we try to remind each other it's about student learning. Um, just because I want to make sure that we get an opportunity to, if you have questions, is that we also want to make sure that our learning environments are safe, that they're um, engaging, and that they are also healthy. So it's from just clean air and good filtration and um, not having infections and you get flu season and things like that, but also mental health. What is the type of how do we behave, how do we interact, if I'm having difficulty at home in the, with my peers or with a teacher? Why do we have counselors? We've invested in mental health programs over the last few years. We have two high school counselors and social workers that are now available. Um, we also have added a, a, a school resource officer in partnership with the police department where we're paying 50% of uh, Chris Stewart, Officer Stewart, to be part of our secondary programs. We also look at and try to revise the different programs. So five years ago, we started a process where every department at the high school identifies programs or classes that they believe need to be pruned. And so we have dropped some classes, and every department was charged with coming forward with two or three options of what they'd like to offer. Now, we can't fund all of those, and we can't do all those, but it's continuing to get our staff to be inventive. Um, this summer, we had five uh, teachers that provided four high school classes during the <coughs> summer to open up the opportunities so that during the school year, teach students could go higher on the ladder with regards to math and science, as well as opportunities to say, I want to broaden my interest. And so if I can pick up a class that counts towards graduation, I'll be able to um, be a little bit more uh, better rounded and um, maybe competitive for post-secondary. We also look at leadership, um, shared leadership. There's a partnership of working with our teachers. We have individuals at every single grade, and in, when you get into secondary, we start to do it around departments. So we have kind of our four core areas of math, science, social studies, and ELA. Um, represent, they meet on a monthly basis. They come forward to talk about student learning, obstacles that are in the way, how we can refine our programs and also um, resources that they might need, as well as kind of trying to articulate new programs that they'd like to put in place. And then obviously, uh, no 
organization, especially in public education. The public part is very important, so we need to have meaningful family partnerships. Um, this year, for the first time, we're trying to change our uh, t traditional parent-teacher nights into what we're calling <coughs> parent engagement nights. And so the high school a few years ago started uh, programs called uh, Parent Universities, where parents could come in and shadow their student. The students weren't there, but they got to learn what it would be like to be a ninth grader or a tenth grader and go through the whole day. Um, the teachers were there. Um, we've done things with community presentations. And so when you think about the broad scope of public education, um, Penny oversees community ed. And then we also have uh, Prescott Community Rec Recreation. So the 80 acres of green space that's available is all covered by and managed by the Prescott Public Schools. Then Penny is the extension of from prenatal to actually uh, working with individuals that might be going through grief and loss from somebody that has passed away. So that and everything in between becomes uh, a, a remarkable feat for an individual to oversee, but in partnership and underneath the Prescott Public Schools. So when I talk about it, if you put all these things together, it looks like a schoolhouse. It's a schoolhouse that at the center is always about student learning. It has many different departments funded mostly by taxpayers and right now a preponderance of the money is coming from the state it's about um, I think it's getting close to two-thirds um, it had been about uh, 45 55 and it shifted back a little bit more to the state but obviously there is still a large um, basis that falls on our local taxpayers so I um, Another time I could tell you a day in the life, no week, no day, depending on what happens, is that when you put 1,400 individuals into small rooms with um, social media, or not social media, and employees, um, everything you hear about in the papers also occurs in our schools. And so we have to make sure that we manage that and we take that very seriously. I'm very proud of um, the work that our staff has done and continue to be happy to lead the Prescott Public Schools. So um, that is kind of the, my vision and kind of role and function of a CEO or a superintendent. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns that you have? Yeah. So you said two thirds is funded by the state and at this point, yes. Yeah. And that shifts based on what they call as equalization aid. And so depending on the amount of um, available tax, whether or not you're tax rich or, or property rich or property poor, um, that number <laughs> continues to change each year. So every community is different. Correct. You get a, a more a highly densified, larger area, it might be significantly more taxpayer dollars and less. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And ours had been um, almost equal. Uh, and initially, when they had the three-legged stool, um, it was the goal for the state to cover two-thirds. It hasn't been two-thirds universally across the state forever since even they had that model. Um, Prescott has been more balanced and just recently, based on kind of the equalization, just started to creep back towards more money coming from the state than from local taxpayers. <coughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Spacuza, just a, a comment. Thank you for all of your leadership here. I, I have three kids in the school system, and I love having them here. And um, we have chosen to live here for the schools in, in large part, so thank you. And also, welcome back. Yeah, We're thank really, you. Yeah. yeah, I'm not official yet. <laughs> Julie's made sure and said no time for that. But, yeah. um, it's a big organization, um, and I would just ask that uh, as you think about Prescott Public Schools, is it really is, and I would just say uh, continue. Uh, I try to be the biggest advocate for public education and the role it plays in a community. The stronger the schools are, the stronger your community is. And we are a part of the community, but we don't dictate the community. And so the community has a lot of questions it has to get through about what it wants to be and if it's going to grow or not grow. And that is, we are part of it. We are going to have to respond to if it grows or not. But there are two housing projects being considered. There are um, Steamboat Inn. You have uh, the sanitarium. 
that's and most pharmacy that are properties that lie vacant and could materialize. And so that either could bring in business, which could bring in people, it could be housing and bring in students. Um, so those are things that as a superintendent, I always have to have my antenna up and uh, my head on a swivel. Um, but your investment in public education is critical. So thank you for coming. Um, Franz told me that if I had more than five people that he would buy me lunch next time. So now that I have it on tape, Franz, you're up. So thank you. Thank you.